Bob Lear is a lost township, tucked away in the trees, just a stone's throw from the road between Ullapool and Inverness at Inverlaw. Centuries of history lie buried and forgotten. In this series, with the help of Ullapool Museum, archaeologists and historical experts, we're bringing the people and stories of Balblair and Inverlaw back to life. Eight snapshots, reimagined moments in Highland history, which have, until recently, been hidden in plain sight. Episode 3, Lenin and Krech, The Age of Plundering. You see the horseshoe there of the forestry. Yeah. This to the left of the forest, you can see all the outlines of stones. This is all Monroe land, and then the river split, and Mackenzie Contails on the other side. And the other two clans awarded each other yeah. for years. Yeah. yeah. Higgisjach, Higgisjach, na tikshivisjach. Come in, come in, come away on in. Can you kusal? A fisum. A can coni by the licht and your bras, the ood in the carriage and your coigroch. It's no much I can, but a friend or stranger can I find a pot of porridge or brews on the fire. Me, is Misha Ertzeroch. I'm Archie Baldman Rowe, simple farmer of the lands of Inverlaw. Simple but we are an ancestry to keep the heat high and the blood warm. Here, we are ah, the sons of David, King David of Scotland himself, from the grand old times, before all this endless brangling and reaving. So we're looking at Robert Moore Munro of Fowlis and Colin Cam Mackenzie of Kintail. I'm Siobhan Beatson. I am the curator at Alto Museum. These two men are probably very similar in that they are clan war chiefs. Robert is actually the clan chief. I don't think at this point Colin Camp is, but he is the son of the chief who is doing all the fighting. Colin Camp is particularly notorious for picking fights with everybody. I'm Dr Ernest McConaugh. I'm a lecturer at Celtic and Gaelic and History at the University of Glasgow. The 16th century in the Gaeltoch or the Highlands or the Gaelic-speaking areas of Scotland is known as Lyngna Crach in Gaelic or the age of plunder, or age of disorder really, due largely to weak governance. So you had, during the 16th century, long periods of royal minority where you had an infant monarch and a regency or weak government and you had increasing uh, power of clans in the Highlands. Edinburgh lawyers defined clans as a sort of snowball conglomeration of kin, friends, allies and partakers. So they're really a, a sort of grouping which crystallises around a chiefly dynasty. Where these clans are successful, they try to expand their territory. I mean, if you if you want to think of the Roman Empire, which keeps expanding, that's at an, this is on a much lower level, but it's the same dynamic. So Clan Donald in previous centuries had been expanding. Clan Donald were now contracting. And the new guys in the block, the Mackenzies of Kintail and the Monroes, were increasingly assertive and trying to impose their will. Mackenzies, they were on the ascendancy. Monroe's were pretty much set here since 1370. This was their glen. Yeah. And they got this from the Earls of Ross for deeds done, which we don't know about that. We haven't cracked it exactly what they got that for. So they had this whole glen, plus all the shielding, all the hill ground, right round as far as you can see, right over to Gluckauer. Wasn't so long ago that we were accorded the respect to our tradition. We lived in peace and in friendship for many a glen, loch and shore around. Sure, wasn't my father's mother a Mackenzie from o'er by. And even now, I have traded blithely in yuch with my distant kinsfolk and gone hunting stag with my cousin Hector, a Mackenzie his cell. But those days are coming to a close. I swear my hail allegiance to my chief, Robert Vor Monroe. Let nae man leash ye otherwise. I am a Monroe and I do my chief's bidding. But our chieftains are no as once they were. True giants, 
lean, honest and strong. They had the air to parley of fair transaction and living in peace with neighbours. No longer. Forgive me, I maun leave you. Once more I hate to forsake my wife, children and Kai, and ah my duties to fecht for my lord, my chief, Robert Vaughan. There's another Mackenzie raid on our land. Hector will have been cried up for his side. Please God, I didn't meet him in the skirmish. He's a braw laddie. Hector. The Bishop of Ross had given his lands and castles all over to his cousin, Leslie of Balquare. A couple of years later, Colin Mackenzie bought the rights of the Channery of Ross. But what didn't come with those rights was the castle. So this argument between the Monroes and the Mackenzies started because the Monroes would not give them the castle that they had paid for. This then started about 10 years of back and forth fighting between the two clans. They hated each other. These are dark days. Nathan and nobody is respected. They kill our men. They steal our kai. I troth they mean to destroy us all. Clear this ancient land of all its Monroes. Here in peace for generation upon generation. And all o'er a castle. We're wearied with bloodletting. Wha counts the cost? The men, the kai, the land, lost. Our chief kens only how to reply in kind. Tis a great burden to serve a chieftain. The love of our chief is strongly inculcated to us in our infancy. Now, though, they seem half the men their fathers and forefathers were. Mackenzie's raided across here, and there would be a real big industrialised happening here. And they started nicking stuff, but they were killing slaughtering, murdering, mutilating too at the same time. Then the Monroe said they put up with it for a couple of years and they said, right, f this. So then they went over there and they started slaughtering over there at Achlunachan. That was another big township. That's the Mackenzie Township. They say there are negotiations afoot. About time. But I have scarce faith in their success. Tis not only our clan chiefs who fail us. The courts, the powers, the vera king is cell. Confusion and murder reign far and wide. This gets as bad as it can get. So we have Colin Mackenzie claiming assessment for the slaughter by Robert Munro of his kin. And this is his mother, his brother, two other kinsmen. So Colin Mackenzie's claiming that Robert Munro has slaughtered his mum. And not by covert means, these are... Culverine and Hagbutt, which are types of cannon and very large muskets. He says these are not small covert murders. This is all open war. On the other side, let's talk about uh, Colin McKenzie's brother Rory has been murdered. The Monroe family has been murdered. This is as bad as it can get. There's probably hundreds of McKenzie's and Monroe slaughtered over the case of the 10 years that this feud kind of goes on for. But the Mackenzies were still at it. They were digging away, they were digging away. And eventually the the, the Beaks and, and Elgin said, look boys, are you going to stop this scrapping? Come down to Elgin and explain yourselves. Typically what would happen with a dispute like this, and this is a process of Scots law, you would have a committee of, of interested friends who would basically grab both parties, bang their heads together, and really they'd come to an agreement. And then they would draw up a legal document. And to uh, make sure that this has the force of law, what they do is they register this at the Court of Session. And this means that if either party defaults, they essentially become outlaws. So this is a, a way of, of really, uh, of trying to embed this. So after four years constant war, they went down to Elgin and each man prepared a document Right, he did this to me, he killed my granny, my two cousins, my father, da, 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 and he stole this and stole that. Then the other fellow prepared a document. So each one blaming the other one for all this misdemeanor. But what we've got is we've got the archive yeah. from 1570 and it details all the stuff that was nicked out here. You couldn't name the people and who were here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I watch as my township, my friends and family grow lesser. Each destroying which the other has sweated for and made. My bairnies, what carry my 
Mackenzie blood as well as Monroe. Their land's sacred rights, their kinship and honour whittled for a great oak to a feeble stick. One of the things we've got is from Inverlaw, there is 140 bowls of oats that have been stolen as part of our ongoing campaign over the winter of 1573-74, kind of December, January. And they've stole 140 bowls of oats, 40 bowls of barley, six horses and 10 bowls of barley and malt. And when we're thinking about this, 140 bowls of oats is 12 tonnes of oats. Each one of these, there's also a couple of murders. One of them has there been a large amount of cattle being stolen. So we've got 80 kai, 20 sturks, 20 young calves and 60 oxen. So that's 180 cattle that have been stolen from Inverloch. So these are the types of things that they're doing across each other. But what's really interesting for me is a funny little bit at the end of second page, eight pounds of hemp. So what they were doing here was they were growing hemp to get the flax, to make the nets, to make the ropes. So that shows real industrialization and settlement. Mm. They were busy, busy people. These are actually incredibly useful numbers. It's really, really difficult to get written documents of the kind of towns, so we have to extract it from documents such as this. We can see then that just how much is being harvested at the end of the year. We know this is in December, so the harvest would have been technically more than that because they would have used some by now. One of the ones that is even more significant potentially, they are talking about the houses and the buildings that have been destroyed. And they talk about houses, the harbour, and one particular which caught my attention is the Lowland Mill has been destroyed. Now to me, it might just be a simple throwaway phrase, but to me that implies that there's potentially more than one mill. When the mill was destroyed, there was 3,500 pounds of oatmeal destroyed. We know from the document that the, the salmon cobal and the nets thereof were nicked. There was 18 bottles of, of salmon nicked, 17 bottles of wine. So the wine is coming in, the commodities are going out, it's a trading back and forth, yeah. back and forth. The information in this court document, which is about something completely different, we're able to extract this information from to create a big, better sense of what we are looking at in terms of settlement size what type of defences they might have. Once the, the, the fighting had stopped between the Monroes and the Mackenzies, the rivalry continued uh, throughout uh, the, the, the remainder of the 16th century and into the 17th century. Uh, the Mackenzies win big during the 16th century. They come out as the major power in Ross. The Monroes remain powerful, but their finances are increasingly on a weaker standing. And you can see this if you look at the respective last will and testament of Colin Mackenzie of Kintail, who dies in 1594, and Hector Monroe Fowles dies in 1603. And Mackenzie of Kintail is really, really wealthy. He's uh, wealthy at a national level. Monroe is encumbered with a lot of debts. So while we can't see all of what's contributed to that, you can see the kind of perhaps this results from Monroe's really losing out in the struggle to the Mackenzies across the last quarter of the 16th century. Gianista do Val Vlaer, war new for Bulblaer, for Inverlaw, for these wild and noble highlands of Scotland. A patch and may have been reached, but so much Killing and thieving will bear bitter fruit for years to come. Hashin ulig na slucha, na surich na vashin. We are all lesser than yins we were. Still, the work goes on. In Hidden in Plain Sight, the experts were Siobhan Beetson, Inus McConaughey, and Duncan Mackenzie. The writer was Chris Dolan, and the actor was Hamish MacDonald. Hidden in Plain Sight was produced by Adventurous Audio Limited 
and made possible thanks to the support of the Audio Content Fund. <laughs>